first of all, what are ketones? Now, technically, ketones are an organic molecule that has a particular type of chemical bond. If this particular type of chemical bond is present, then the molecule will be considered a ketone. Now, within that pretty large family of molecules, there are some things that are commonly referred to as the ketone bodies. That to me is a little cumbersome. So over the course of this lesson, I'm just going to call it, uh, just I'm going to call them ketones. Now, you'll notice earlier I said the word exogenous. You've likely heard that term before as a term of physiology or as a term of medicine, but exogenous could be compared with the term endogenous where one refers to something that is coming from outside the body, that's the exo part, the, the prefix exo or exogenous. The other, endogenous, endo, is coming from within the body itself. So the very fact that we have something called exogenous ketones, of course, implies that there is something called endogenous ketones. So let's talk about those first. What are the ketones that we make? Now, first of all, there are three relevant ketones ketones that fall within the ketone body uh, family, but generally these are just the ketones as we think of them. The main one, the mother ketone, is a ketone called acetoacetate. And then it will get split into two different types of ketones, one called acetone, which is a ketone that just gets excreted. It is irreversible. Once it is turned into acetone, it is gone. It must be eliminated from the body, either in the breath or in the urine. The other molecule that acetoacetate can turn into, and indeed does so more readily or more, more commonly, is one called beta-hydroxybutyrate. And beta-hydroxybutyrate being the most common, that's the one that is typically measured. When you're getting your, uh, doing a finger stick and you're measuring your glucose or your, or your ketones with a ketone meter, that is what you're measuring, beta-hydroxybutyrate. However, when you are urinating out ketones and measuring your ketone levels on a urine stick, you're measuring the acetone because the acetone has to be excreted. There's no place for it in the body. But in contrast, beta-hydroxybutyrate can be metabolized. And this is why it is, is valuable. And we'll get on to later, we'll get into why you would want ketones in just a moment. But before we do, do so, I wanted to highlight just some of the biochemistry within the body that puts the body in a position to be making ketones which would be into a position that is generally going to be ketosis. Now, ketones have the ability to have a hydrogen molecule that can come off of it, hydrogen ion that can come off of the ketone. And that makes the ketone capable of making the blood more acidic. Now, at a normal level that most people could get to, You'll, it is impossible to make so much ketone that it actually affects your pH. I really need to emphasize this. It is, it is, it is practically impossible for a non-diabetic person to do this. Now, in contrast, if you have a person who is an untreated type 1 diabetic, they can get ketone levels that are so high that it gets into the realm of what's called ketoacidosis. But that's a substantially elevated um, ketone level. That's like a house that is burning. Whereas ketosis is a fireplace, whereas, and then you compare that to the average individual and their ketone levels are so low, it's like a match. Now, why is the average person having, experiencing such low levels of ketones to the point that it often can't be even detected on a ketone meter? That's because their insulin levels are chronically elevated. So back to the biochemistry somewhat. When you are breaking down nutrients, whether it is through glucose or whether it is through fats, the common molecule will those where these pathways will converge, glucose burning or fat burning, they'll get to a molecule called acetyl-CoA. And then acetyl-CoA will go into something called the citrate cycle. That's what I call it. It's the TCA cycle, the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle. All of those are the same thing. I call it the citrate cycle. And in so doing is capable of generating much more energy for the cell. However, when you have a lot of acetyl-CoA being being uh, being made, you have a lot of molecules getting into the citrate cycle and it essentially starts to get too full. All of the enzymes that are busy creating energy from acetyl-CoA are, are overloaded. And so the acetyl-CoA starts to accumulate. And at that point, acetyl-CoA has two options. It can either turn into lipid, so the acetyl-CoA molecules can start to join together. This is a process called lipogenesis. 
Or the acetyl-CoA can take the other pathway, the one less traveled, if you will, which is ketogenesis. It becomes ketones. Now, how does the cell, how does acetyl-CoA know which path it should go down? Well, it is entirely a function of the humble hormone insulin. If insulin is elevated, then acetyl-CoA will take the path of lipogenesis because insulin has activated that whole process and at the same time has inhibited the ketogenic pathway. It has closed that door. Every single enzyme of ketogenesis is going to be inhibited by elevated insulin. So insulin forecloses the ketogenic pathway and opens the door to the lipogenic pathway, thereby converting the acetyl-CoA into fat, into new fat through lipogenesis. In contrast, if insulin is low, then the ketogenic pathway is opened and encouraged. All those enzymes are very active. And now at that same time, the lipogenic pathway is closed because it requires insulin to be elevated for it to be fully active. So you can see that while acetyl-CoA is a nexus molecule standing at the crossroads of nutrient metabolism with two different fates ahead of it, two different paths, the lipogenic and the ketogenic, um, it is insulin that determines which path it takes.